I'm Daniel Fontaine, and you're watching BC Poly Talk. And I'm Bill Tillman, co-host. On the show this week, we have uh, Andrew Wilkinson. He's the leader of the BC Liberal Party, also the MLA for Vancouver Colchena. Bill, uh, very pleased to have Andrew Wilkinson here during the May sweeps. Uh, I know it'll help boost our ratings, uh, getting a leader of the opposition on BC Poly Talk. I know when, when we were prepping for this program, you and I had a shopping list of questions. We don't have a lot of time. So what are you going to focus on the show today? Well, I want to talk and see what Mr. Wilkinson has to say about the uh, interesting situation, the change, the dynamic of BC politics, where the BC Liberals and the Green Party are working with the NDP government uh, on a host of COVID-19 and health issues. Norm Letnick, the health critic for the BC Liberals, has been consulted very closely by Adrian Dix, the health minister, as has Sonia Furstenau, the Green health critic. And I want to know, with an election next year, scheduled for the fall of next year, are we going to have a fundamental sea change in BC politics where there's less arguments, less hammer and tong and more cooperation? I don't think so, but we'll see what Mr. Wilkinson says. I think Glenn Clark told you last week that uh, you were smoking something. <laughs> if you, <laughs> It's legal uh, now. Firewood. It's legal now. <laughs> well, it is legal, but you're definitely smoking something if you think that there's not going to be fireworks in BC politics. Some of the questions that I uh, and topics I'd like to ask uh, Andrew Wilkinson, I'm going to start off the top. Uh, they just issued a media release uh, uh, so in support of the restaurant industry. They made some interesting recommendations, which, which I think the NDP have already adopted a couple of those. Back to your point of everybody working together uh, these times, that's not something normal. Um, in addition to that, I'm, I'm going to raise uh, the issue. As you know, I work in the long term care sector and many carries are wondering these days why the Liberals have been so silent and not uh, talking and commenting about the fact that they haven't had any hero pay yet. They're still waiting nine weeks into this pandemic and still haven't had any hero pay compared to their colleagues in Alberta and Ontario and Quebec. So I'm going to be asking the BC Liberals about that. And maybe it's this whole camaraderie and working together that has resulted in them not saying anything. Who knows? Well, I want to try and break us out of uh, our uh, unofficial name, COVID-19 talk, uh, because, you know, we talk a lot about it and understandably so with the pandemic going on and all the impact it's had on all British Columbians. But I want to talk about one thing in particular, Daniel, and that's uh, the agreement between the federal and provincial government with the Wet'suwet'en her hereditary chiefs. And uh, I know that Ellis Ross, the MLA uh, from the BC Liberal Caucus, has been quite outspoken and concerned about that. And the, the elected uh, chiefs uh, versus the hereditary chiefs are, are fighting it out. Uh, and I also, so I want to ask uh, Andrew Wilkinson what his position is on that, and also whether UNDRIP, the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, is a factor in all of this because it was unanimously supported by the legislature, uh, by by Mr. Wilkinson, by Premier John Horgan, and and uh, Andrew Weaver, who was then the Green Party leader. So does that play into the Wet'suwet'en dispute? And I'm going to ask him probably what I think might be the toughest question of the uh, podcast this week or the show, and that is what is going to be the election question in 2021. And uh, uh, assuming we have an election, then there's some there is some talk and some rumblings that uh, given that John Horgan, the NDP, are riding pretty high in the polls, that there might be a, an election this fall. But I'm going to ask him, what does he think is actually going to be on the ballot and what can the Liberals do to kind of capture the public's imagination to uh, secure a victory in the next provincial election? No, oh, that's that's a tough question. All right. And uh, I, I was worried you were going to suggest a, a Trump type solution that uh, the the election is nullified if uh, the government isn't reelected. But I don't I don't think that's serious in the United States. And it's certainly not up here. Well, we should uh, no, we should I get to it. We should get to it. Well, be, yes, we'll be right back with uh, Andrew Wilkinson, leader of the B.C. Liberal Party. B.C. Polytalk thanks Harbor Air for supporting the show. It's through sponsorship and viewer support that we get to produce this show. So welcome to the show, uh, Andrew Wilkinson is the leader of the BC Liberal Party, also a member of the Legislative Assembly for Vancouver Quilchetta. That's my old stomping ground when I used to yes. work there uh, many moons ago. Uh, welcome to the show, Andrew. Very pleased to have you on. Uh, we're just going to jump right on into it. We have a lot of questions for you this week. We're going to start off with something that was actually a fairly recent, uh, just an announcement that the BC Liberals made, the BC Liberal opposition, around restaurants some suggestions and recommendations that you made to the government around trying to get uh, restaurants more economically uh, viable again. Do you want to just let our uh, viewers know a little bit about that? And is the government enacting some of those recommendations? Yes, this came up from conversations about two weeks ago with a number of small restaurant operators who told us their issues were 
first of all, spacing. Uh, with the new rules, they're going to perhaps take 30 to 50 percent of the customers they used to. They're worried about consumer confidence, which we all are. And they're also worried about the, the process and overhead of running the business. And of course, since what, March 15th, there's been zero revenue. Some of them have some takeout, but the ones who uh, fill us in tell us that it's about 3% of the usual revenue and they're actually losing money. They're just doing it to keep the wheels turning. I went to a place last night that's normally packed with about 50 people. There's no one there. And I was the only order on, on the menu. So you got to really feel for these people. They're struggling and they face all the uh, commercial issues like rents being due and taxes and all the rest of that. Plus, they have the whole need to um, make sure their product is attractive and there's consumer confidence and a bunch of refits to their space. So it's hard enough running a women's clothing shop now, let alone a shoe store. And you go to the restaurant space and it's doubly or triply hard. So with all that in mind, I talk to chain restaurants as well. The same issues, only times 50 or 100, depending on the number of outlets they've got. So we said, look, what can we do to these to make life easier for these folks? What can we make suggestions, proposals for our Premier Horgan? And we put that letter together uh, Wednesday morning. And it started off with... We used to be able to deduct 100% of the cost of restaurant meal against business expenses until about 15 years ago, and then it went down to 50%, which is unusual in the world. And most places, it's 100%. So we said, well, why not just put it back up? It'll encourage businesses to spend. It'll, it'll encourage more restaurant traffic, get the wheels of commerce moving again. We also said uh, make liquor more readily available, because right now they have to go to BCLDB, and if you're a restaurant in Kamloops, it has to be delivered from a warehouse in Vancouver. I mean, this is a bit silly. So we said, why not just make it so you can buy your alcohol from any outlet you want to? And a couple of other things like making sure that their uh, patio spaces can be expanded and whatever liquor license they have for an existing patio should apply to any expanded space. No red tape to go through to say we're going from 10 to 20 patio seats. Just give them the liquor license for the whole thing. So a couple of those things were adopted immediately by uh, the NDP, and we're glad to see that because what we're trying to do is get stuff out onto the table for consideration by the public and by today's government under John Horgan so that we can improve the lot of British Columbians. We're in a tight spot, folks. I think we all know that, and it's worldwide. But British Columbia's economy is heavily based on small business and services. We just don't have the big head offices here. And so we are very vulnerable to people just simply running out of money. And that's going to be a hard story for the rest of this year as these enterprises try to keep rolling and just run out of cash. The one I think of all the time are those little mom and pop places in food fairs and shopping malls. They're often run by immigrant families. They put the whole family assets, everything they've got into those places. They've never been cash cows. They just struggle along and make money and they're out, you know, cutting noodles at six o'clock in the morning to make it go. And you think of the fear they will face now, having to reopen, not sure what the rules are, the cost of protective equipment, and then reopening with their fingers clutched on the countertop, hoping that somebody will show up and buy the product. You've got to really feel for those folks. Andrew, one of the other sectors which has really been hard hit, and it's part of uh, the restaurant industry as part of it, is the is the tourism industry. And oh, we've yes. had a lot of questions, uh, generally speaking, about how to bring back tourism both internally within BC, and, and Dr. Bonnie Henry has suggested if you're going to go somewhere, don't go too far at this stage. Right. Uh, but what do you see in the longer term? Because you know we've had YVR lay off 1,500 staff. We've got uh, some amazing tourism attractions in this province that really do depend on, at least partially, on, on international tourists. And uh, I can't see too many of them coming this year, or I'm not even sure next year. No, and I think we have to uh, parse that out a little bit. When we think of tourism in the short term, perhaps to Labor Day, it's going to be us, folks. We've got to patronize our local establishments and get out there and enjoy British Columbia in a safe way and keep these enterprises going and give them the hope that there'll be another year. If they're winter tourism operators, you know, is anybody going to be booking for the, the fall and winter of this coming season? Uh, not right now, for sure. Maybe in the fall when things have settled down. And then if we can keep all these enterprises viable, 
So in the spring of 2021, they'll start to get back to normal. Uh, you know, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I suspect most of them will not actually make any money in the next 16 months. They'll be keeping the doors open and keeping it rolling along. And like the restaurant sector, there will sadly be some failures. Now, we had a call 10 days ago with the small business crowd and a woman came on the phone from Victoria who is responsible for the grizzly bear viewing industry and has her own operation as well. She said, look, we're paying commercial rent for four different things, an office, storage space, moorage, and a fourth item. And we have zero bookings for 2020. And we're returning deposits left, right, and center. And like any responsible business, they've already spent the deposits to get set up for this season. And now there's nothing. So they're actually in the hole for 2020 substantially. And so we looked around and said, quite apart from the uh, restaurant industry benefits that you folks are going to need, we said, you're going to have to have substantial marketing assets put at your disposal. And government's got to come to the table for that. Because think of those grizzly bear viewing folks. They're in the hole. They're not sure if they can operate in 2021. They've got a fantastic, unique product that generates serious money all up and down the coast of British Columbia. So if we can get the marketing dollars into Dusseldorf and Dallas and Melbourne, then they'll have a good 2021. If they are looking into their laps in this in October of this year and saying, we've got nothing, we can't invest, we can't market, we can't do anything, we can't bring any deposits, what are we going to do? That will be a very, very sad story throughout British Columbia in 2021. And we cannot let that happen. So, Andrew, speaking of uh, financial mess, uh, I'm going to switch over to the topic of ICBC. Um, and oh. I'd like to, to, <laughs> Bill to talk to you a little bit about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this week, uh, Minister E.B. came out, and there were a lot of British Columbians, I think, who were thinking with so few cars on the road and so few accidents that they would finally get some kind of a dividend, a COVID dividend in terms of uh, ICBC. But we found out this week that it doesn't look like there's going to be any dividend. I, I, I was quite surprised to, to see that even ICBC with fewer cars on the road has managed to somehow uh, find a way of getting into debt. Uh, what's your perspective on that? Would the Liberals be doing anything differently right now other than just watching ICBC kind of slowly churn away and burn cash over the next uh, 12 months? Well, uh, we'll start with an answer that we'll also conclude with which is we've said for two years now, motorists deserve a choice in British Columbia. This massive state run monopoly has ceased to be a functional uh, thing for British Columbians. People resent ICBC. They have bad experiences left, right and center with ICBC and they pay top price for this bad consumer experience. So why not give people a choice? Even in Saskatchewan where they have no fault, they also have the choice of the alternative. And so why not give people the option and you roll into the current environment. There are two cars in our household right now, one $1,500 a year to insure. And I've been going out roughly once a week and cleaning the dust off the windows and, and basically taking it on an errand to make sure it keeps running. So it's doing about 10 kilometers a week. The other vehicle is used a bit more, but the premium on that one doubled to $3,200 a year this year. And we're in the process of moving down to one vehicle but you think, wait a second, we're paying $5,000 a year for vehicles that don't move. So do we start de-insuring them or changing the insurance? You know, we got to assume that British Columbians don't have a lot of excess cash around these days to throw at ICBC to make ICBC feel good. So when the announcement came out yesterday, there was going to be no kind of rebate or remission of the sort that's happened all over North America with commercial insurers. They're sending money back. But BC, ICBC is saying, well, gee whiz, we lost money in our investments. Well, everybody did, folks. And for the most part, they're bouncing back nicely. So that's a pretty lame excuse. So the question comes up, who is working for whom here? Do we feed ICBC because it exists and we have no choice? Or is the idea that the auto insurer is supposed to work for us? And so to return to where I started, People in British Columbia deserve a choice, so they don't have to just take the monopoly answer from ICBC that someone on high has decided that you don't get any money back because we need it, pay up, because there's no choice. Uh, 
I, I have to add on to that one, uh, as you might guess. Uh, I can remember when Gordon Campbell, uh, former BC Liberal Premier, was going to do something similar. He appointed Nick Gear, a, a, a very well-known business person, who was convinced that ICBC actually was the best option and, and nothing happened under that BC Liberal administration. Are, are you saying that you might uh, allow competition, but you would keep ICBC or you could, or, or will you decide at some future point? Well, I've been very consistent on this for about two years now, Bill, saying what we need to do is get all of the choices from the common law world on the table. What do they do in New Zealand, Australia, New Jersey, and Britain, Ireland, all across Canada? There are about 15 different models, at least. There are five different models in Canada alone. Put them on the table, figure out the true pricing, not the propaganda pricing from the uh, vested interests who want to sell themselves, whether it's ICBC or otherwise, and offer the choice to British Columbians. Put it out to British Columbians and say, would you like us to pursue this or not? Because this should be working for consumers. Only in British Columbia do we have this state-run monolith saying, thou shalt take the most expensive auto insurance in Canada, and thou hast no choice. Give me money. I mean, when did that become the only choice in the world? And why are we stuck in this thinking that's 45 years old? So, Andrew, I think you know that uh, switching topics a bit uh, off of ICB, so I think you know, I, I'm, I, for at least for a few more days, I'm still working in seniors care. And, and an issue that has come up, um, it's in the Vancouver Sun actually today as we're taping, around hero pay and getting money into the genes of all these front care care, line, uh, care workers. And I, I'll tell you, in, in my day job, I'm getting call after call from, from care aides who are saying, they were promised that they were going to get some additional pay uh, way back about eight, nine weeks ago. And still, there's no money in the genes of those frontline heroes. Yet I'm not hearing the BC Liberals out uh, criticizing very loudly on that. Is there a reason why everyone seems to have been fairly silent? Because I know I know the care home operators and the and the care aides are really hoping that something, some money will flow soon. Yeah, it's a very particular question, Daniel. And I actually personally roll myself back to 2003 in a conference center in Ottawa when I worked for Premier Campbell and it was the First Minister's Conference, uh, Prime Minister Cretchen at the time, and the whole discussion was around the structure of home care and long-term care in Canada, and there were a few different models going on at the time across the country. That's 17 years ago, and we've had a significant increase in life expectancy since then. We have more seniors in our communities and our population, but we're still running on this kind of Band-Aid approach that we had 20 and 30 years ago. Think way back, you know, there used to be Shaughnessy Hospital here. That was built for veterans of World War I. And that's where long-term care and extended care hospitals started, was for people who were injured in wars and could not return to the street. And we've had a patchwork approach since then. There's now a call from some political affiliates of Mr. Thielman to nationalize the whole thing. And that's a very expensive proposition for a bunch of reasons. But rather than getting the particulars of the current pay scale for care aides in our existing home care system, I think there's an appetite amongst the public to say, well, let's just hit the pause button here. What went wrong, particularly what went wrong in Quebec, where there's been a disaster in the long-term care facilities? We've got our own smaller iceberg here in British Columbia, because that's where most of the deaths in British Columbia have been, is, have been in long-term care facilities. So why don't we as a society take a step back and say, is this the right model? What about ownership? What about wages? What about working conditions? What about infection control? Because this population of aged people is not going to shrink in spite of this wretched epidemic that is killing an undue number of them. The population is going to be there and it's going to grow. So unless we're prepared to face a variant of this again in three or five years, we should have a very good look at whether this is the right model for the, uh, the go forward uh, period of time. I'm wondering, Andrew, also, uh, again, switching gears because we got a lot of topics to cover. Um, we've seen an unprecedented level of cooperation in British Columbia uh, in politics. Uh, yourself and Premier Horgan and uh, the Green Party, the NDP, the Liberals. Uh, Norm Letnick, your health critic, has been working with Adrian Dix and Sonia First to know the Greens very closely. Do you think that this will last uh, some kind of extended period? Will it change the face of, of BC politics or with an election year coming up next year, do you think it'll be back to the usual hammer and tong? 
Well, this largely comes out of the fact that I went through medical school and practice medicine in the past. And so what has distressed me from the beginning of this conversation about um, COVID-19 in January and February is the amount of amateur cheap shotting going on, on the internet. And it's, we'll come to this later, but how much it's happened and been amplified in the USA. It is destructive, it's amateurish, it's embarrassing, it's bad for the public and bad for public health. So right from the get-go, I said at the start of February, our job as a society is to fight the virus, not fight each other. That applies to racism, that applies to public health issues, that applies to our approach to defeating the virus. And so Dr. Henry's done a very good job. We've had a very low um, level of prevalence and incidence of the, the disease in British Columbia compared to elsewhere, very low mortality. And so we're now reaping the benefits of that and we don't regret for a second having been supportive of Dr. Henry and Adrian Dix for the last six weeks. The, the stat that I always haul out is, and it changes day to day, Sweden and Massachusetts each have about double the population of British Columbia. Sweden has had 25 times the death rate of British Columbia and Massachusetts it's 30 times. So we did something right. Mm -hmm. And our small part of that was not being difficult and obnoxious and argumentative in the process. There's enough of that on the internet, for goodness sake. We don't need it in the legislature. I, so I going been, forward on the economic issues, we'll be much more uh, clear and assertive in our positions because Although Bill might like to think we think the NDP are clever and capable on the economy, we would <laughs> beg to differ on that one. I'm glad you got that in. <laughs> well, Andrew, uh, I think that, that I agree with you. I think the public doesn't want opposition to be uh, kind of critical for just being just a critic. But I think if I look at, for example, we've talked about this on the program the last few weeks. I look at some like, for example, on the federal side. There has been legitimate criticism of things like not bringing parliament back, uh, not bringing back enough, uh, having the prime minister come out every morning in front of uh, Rideau, call, uh, Rideau a house and just answer a few questions and go back. There are some legitimate questions, I think, that have been asked on the national level. Do you not think more questions should have been asked on the provincial level, even on the health file over the last uh, number of weeks? Well, the health file is a rolling ball that changes every day. And so rather than cheap hindsight of what Bonnie Henry should have said on February 3rd, we've been approaching it as the job is to defeat the virus. And fortuitously for all of us, that's going very well. So we're now down to about 70 people in hospital, a dozen people in ICU. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the virus. Then the hard question comes up, so what are we going to do now? And we are getting to be much more visible and assertive saying, well, there's actually a better way of moving forward than what the NDP are proposing. Uh, to his credit, uh, Adrian Dix has been out almost daily as frequently as Bonnie Henry is. I mean, they can't work seven days a week, so six days a week is good enough for us. They've done that for six weeks now under fairly pressurized circumstances, and we've had a good uh, level of communication with them. Uh, there has been essentially no communication on economic issues between us and the NDP administration because they don't want to hear it. They seem to know they think they know best. And so we will take it to the public if they won't take it directly. Um, sounds like that they were, we can look forward to at least some fireworks in the new year and uh, in the election year, of course. Um, I wanted to ask you another question, which uh, may also provoke uh, a, a difference of opinion with the government. We've seen uh, in the last week the, the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs sign an agreement with uh, the provincial government and the federal government, and now the elected uh, band council chiefs have said, we weren't consulted, we heard, didn't hear about this, we're opposed to this. I know your MLA, Ellis Ross, who's been quite outspoken on this issue before, is, is quite unhappy. Uh, what's your view of the Wet'suwet'en situation and what it means for elected First Nations officials versus hereditary? Well, we work from very strong principles on this, that we are all people in British Columbia, we all belong here, we're residents, we're citizens, and everybody deserves to be engaged as a citizen. And so what's distressing about the approach that's been taken is saying they're elected band councils, but they're going to be ignored on this issue, and they'll talk with hereditary chiefs instead. And there's been some turmoil amongst hereditary chiefs of how they got the position and whether all of them are engaged on this or not. So given that degree of complexity, 
and the degree of disagreement between all the different parties, we said early on, look, there was an injunction issued by the BC Supreme Court and Prince George. If people didn't like that on the coastal gasoline construction, their option was to appeal it. They didn't do that. So that's the rule of law. That's the law of the land. Off we go in terms of the pipeline. The politics around it continued from there on. And then we had the federal minister and the NDP uh, minister, Scott Fraser, show up and say they're going to come up with an overall agreement that would solve the issues. In our estimation, it has not solved much of anything. It's created a whole bunch of dissent. And as we know, Bob Ray used to be the NDP Premier of Ontario, and he came out immediately after it was announced, former federal Liberal cabinet minister, and said this is a big mistake. Because what they're doing is validating uh, dissent and confusion all across Canada in terms of governance amongst First Nations. So the opportunity was there to try and bring the parties together and come up with a an overall structure and arrangement within the Wet'suwet'en people. And Premier Horgan said, well, it's up to them to solve that. There's an element of truth in that. So if that's the case, why did a federal minister and Scott Fraser for the NDP go in and arguably stir the pot and come out with this agreement that is causing street demonstrations in Smithers now? Do, do you think, if I could just follow up on that, Andrew, do you think the, the passage of UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which was supported unanimously in the BC legislature, does that complicate things or does that play into what's happening up there right now? And how, how do we sort this out in the public mind? Well, the legislation the NDP put forward in the fall and that uh, was passed the legislature with our support basically said UNDRIP exists and this act will allow for a process to figure out how it applies. So we're okay with that. And it's now to a limited degree been paraded around to say, well, that's what has led to this Wet'suwet'en situation. I think that's absolute nonsense. What led to this Wet'suwet'en situation is competing factions for governance of a people who've been there since time immemorial, and there's already been litigation in the past in dealing with their rights and title, and it needs to get resolved. But saying that one group is to be preferred over another as a governance body doesn't actually solve anything. And that's why we're now seeing street demonstrations in Smithers in the heart of Wet'suwet'en territory, because there are an awful lot of people who feel disenfranchised, and to be blunt, an awful lot of them are women. And so we need to make sure that there's a voice for everybody in the Wet'suwet Nation as they resolve their governance so that all of us in British Columbia can move forward rather than saying that there's a small faction who'll be the boss and they'll be the only people who have to be listened to. So, Andrew, we, we only have a few minutes left, so we're going to maybe look a little bit forward. Uh, we, uh, but, but before we do that, I'm going to look back to last week. We had former NDP Premier Glenn Clark on, and uh, we don't have the ability to kind of pull a clip and play it again, but I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase what he said uh, based on a question from Bill. Bill asked him whether or not he thought any of this uh, rapprochement and kumbaya singing between the opposition <laughs> and the NDP would continue uh, into the uh, next year and, and if there'd be anything that would remain permanent. Well, Glenn just laughed at that one and said, no, that's, we're going to go back <laughs> to election mode. So if we can turn our head forward a little bit to them, we know elections coming in the next 18 months, it has to. Uh, if you could comment on a couple things, how has COVID uh, impacted your nominations? I know the BC Liberal Party had already opened up prior to um, the pandemic, uh, the nominations were starting uh, in earnest. So if you could comment a little bit about that and what do you guys see as being the uh, election issue? What, what do you think we're going to, given we're so right now in depth with COVID, is there anything else we're going to talk about in the next 18 months or is there something else that you think might be the election issue? Yeah, we had three nominations done early this year just before all of the shutdown occurred and we've got one pending now that's going to be conducted by mail and we expect that result in mid-June. And going forward, we're sorting out how that's going to be managed, uh, depending on what the opening up is. There's a kind of understanding in politics that it's a contact sport. You've got to be talking to people and meeting people and looking each other over. But everybody's going to have to adapt to the new reality and say, well, you can't just freeze us in January 31st, 2020, and hope for the best. You have to keep moving forward because people expect you to and that's what parties do and that's what governance requires in terms of the election question there is such uncertainty in our society right now and i think if we fast forwarded to labor day will the kids be back in school 
probably, but in a very different format. Uh, will the economy be recovering? I sure hope so. Will some people have had to declare bankruptcy? Probably. So there'll be a whole uh, focus on certainty in the fall and where we're going. And then a year from now, uh, assuming the election is more than 12 months from today, then the, I think the question is going to be, are we being governed in a way that leads to the recovery that we anticipate and that we're seeing elsewhere? Because if we continue to fumble around with the kind of uncertainty that the NDP have generated now through all of this work safe effort, people are going to be in a very distressed state saying, I thought the government was supposed to guide us through this stuff, not say figure it out on your own. And I think uh, Premier Horgan's done himself no great favors by saying they're just making it up as they're going along. That's not comforting to people when there's a $63 billion budget being spent on behalf of 5 million people. You expect a better approach than that. It sounds like you're gearing up already, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> and, and of course, I'll, I leave it to Daniel to ask the most difficult question that we've asked any guest. What's the ballot question 18 months from now? Uh, but Andrew, I want to thank you, and, and I know Daniel will as well, uh, for joining us. I really appreciate it and getting your perspective. Well, thanks for making it possible, and hopefully we'll do this in person in the foreseeable future. But one step at a time. Remember, we're going to fight the virus, not each other. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Andrew. Really appreciate it. And we'll be right back. Thank you. All the best. BC Polytalk thanks Harbor Air for supporting the show. It's through sponsorship and viewer support that we get to produce this show. Well, Daniel, as we predicted, uh, I think we're going to see some fireworks in the election year next year. Uh, we have the election scheduled for October. There's always rumors that it could happen before then. And I think Andrew Wilkinson, uh, in a pretty polite way, given the circumstances that we're, as he said, we're all fighting the virus on each other right now. I think he laid out some pretty substantive policy differences with the NDP government that he hopes will make him the next premier. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it will come as any surprise to our viewers or listeners that uh, he wants to look at things like privatizing ICBC. I mean, that's been on the table. He was pretty emphatic about that. He hasn't moved off that position. Um, he also, you know, I think uh, rightly the BC Liberals can lay some credit. They're going to take some credit in terms of the, the management of COVID-19 in the province. And he outlined uh, you can kind of see some of the talking points of where they're going to go that it was you know in part because of their work with the government that bc ended up setting itself apart from other jurisdictions and he looked at sweden and massachusetts and interesting on that so uh, but i i do think that i mean the summers are typically a bit quieter on the political side and i don't think that will change but come september october i think the pivot will happen i think we're going to see um, a lot more aggressive uh, bc liberal opposition as we head into the final uh, one-year countdown well, I'm going to differ with you a little on your first comment because I think, uh, and we'll have to roll the tape back, but what I heard from Andrew Wilkinson was that they are going, why Why can't British Columbians have competition? Uh, and so that wouldn't involve uh, privatizing ICBC necessarily. I, I don't think he said he would privatize ICBC. So I could, I don't know whether he means an ICBC would continue, but have basic insurance uh, competing uh, on with the private companies and ICBC at the same time. Anyway, we'll we'll find out more about that, I'm sure. I also thought, uh, you know, it was interesting. He talked about, uh, uh, to your question in your sector, about uh, the fact that long-term care workers have not received uh, additional pay for the challenges that they're facing, et cetera. He didn't actually say he would do that. Uh, so a good politician uh, complains about their opponents and doesn't necessarily commit themselves to doing something. Yeah, on that topic, obviously, it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, but the issue of the nationalization, there has been a call, I think the federal NDP have called for all care homes in Canada to be taken over by the government and to be operated. I don't know what, uh, I don't know if Jagmeet Singh has costed that out yet, but I'm sure it's in the, the multi billions of dollars in terms of, of the cost. So you can see that they're going to position themselves as not going down that road. But I'm not sure whether or not you know, Minister Dix and Premier Horgan are going to take that on as well in the next uh, 12 months. That it would be, I mean, as you can imagine, it's been so challenging just to get pay to these care aides in the last nine weeks. You can imagine nationalizing a whole long-term care system in the next 12 months leading into the election would be mired with uh, a lot of uh, problems. 
Well, you know, Daniel, the, uh, more generally, there's there's two theories uh, for both the federal and provincial government on on doing some things that should be expensive and controversial. And one is, are you kidding? Like we're already deep in debt, et cetera. And the other is, what's what's a few more million or a few more billion bucks uh, given the circumstances we're in? So uh, it'll be very interesting to see what both uh, Premier John Horgan and uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau decide on that. But uh, I mean, there there is, you know, I think we saw from some of Andrew Wilkinson's comments as well, that there doesn't seem to be any any real end in sight to the massive additional expenditures that the provincial government is is going to have to take on, whether it's NDP, Liberal, Green, or who knows what. I think we still have a lot of challenges and a lot of expenses ahead because of this pandemic. Yeah, but Bill, you have to be really careful on that because we, we're going to go through phases in this COVID uh, pandemic. You're going to go through the fear phase. You're going to go through the shock and awe phase. But at some point, we're going to move beyond uh, just uh, accepting the fact that the prime minister comes out or the premier and another billion dollars is spent. People I know, even in my own circle, are asking, where's all this money coming from? Where are we? Who's going to pay for all of this? And so um, you're going to start seeing things like credit downgrades for the province, for uh, provinces in the country. You're going to start seeing this, these uh, potentially uh, interest rates at some point going up and where is the money going to come to pay for all of this? So I think we're going to transition a bit out of the shock and awe of the actual COVID. And then this fall and into next year, people are going to be looking for a government that's got a plan to actually being able to pay for it. That doesn't involve more money coming out of their jeans at a time when they don't have that money. I don't necessarily disagree, Daniel, but just look, we saw Mr. Wilkinson talking about the restaurant industry and the need to try and support restaurant industry. You'd like to see more money for health or home, home care workers, of course, and I, I don't disagree with that at all. But I think that there's a, an infinite demand on the government purse for aid. Uh, we talked about tourism as well, uh, which is in dire straits and will be for some time to come, I think. Uh, so I, I think it's an open question uh, when start, people start worrying about the debt, uh, and, and maybe it's when they start seeing tax increases for those who are working. No, and that's going to be the real thing, Bill, is that uh, if we are in an economic malaise for the next few years, the last thing that anybody wants those restaurants is for higher taxes to pay for the, the programs that we're now uh, putting out. So we'll see. But it was a great interview. I really enjoyed uh, our time with Andrew Wilkinson. And uh, thanks so much for tuning in to BC Poly Talk again this week. I'm Daniel Fontaine. I will see you next week. I'm Bill Tillman, and I will see you next week for our season finale. Bye for now. And remember, you can find everything at our website, bcpolytalk.ca. You can also chase us down on Spotify and iTunes for podcasts. You can find us on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook and find links there. You can go to YouTube and see the show. 